Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 172, Take a Little Trip, Great Games to Bring with You on Vacation. I'm Sean and here with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, working with you to make your game nights better. We record here live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it's always awesome when we can see you here live in the chat room, our lobby. Now, tomorrow morning, Dan and I leave for a short vacation, and I thought that would make tonight a great time to talk about vacation gaming and our favorite games to bring on a trip. After that, we've got a review of the retail version, or I guess the, the, the production version is probably a better way to put it, of Garinto and the five-player expansion and the Kickstarter upgrade kit. We wrap up with the Bellhops tabletop, where I've got three more games off the pile of shame, as well as plays of some old favorites. Welcome to the suggestion box. Your way, highlight. I don't even know what happened there. Your way, your way, highlight. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We haven't done this well, both positive and negative. We've got lots of superhero RPG chatter this oh, yeah. week, starting with Chubby Wonder Woman, who commented on our Mar Marvel Multiverse playtest review to say, my biggest problems include that some powers, like flight, are not accessible at rank one. Other issues include the fact that powers like mighty take away from the might ability i.e. Iron Man has a might of 2 and a mighty 2 power. Spider-Man has a might of 5 and a mighty 1 power. This would lead you to believe that Spidey is stronger than Iron Man, but he's not in the game. Iron Man can lift a bus, but Spider-Man cannot, which does not jive with the comics. See, this right here is exactly what I don't like about this style of superhero game, where they give you numbers for everything and they rank everyone. Marvel heroes, both in attributes and powers, are honestly all over the damn place. I'm sure in at least one Spider-Man series, Spider-Man can't lift the bus, and I'm sure in another one, Iron Man can. It's just one of those things that doesn't make sense. And then you've got their power levels, their strengths, their weaknesses all change from one author to the next or one series to the next. When you actually give everything numbers, geeks like Chubby Wonder Woman are going to sit there and compare those numbers. And no matter what they do, there's going to be someone who thinks those numbers are wrong. Indeed, one of the best things about comics is seeing and reading about the things playing out and not having to complain about what is and isn't possible. Mm -hmm. The more you narrowly define those things, though, the more you define what is and isn't possible, and the more chances that exist to conflict with our personal feelings about the characters and comics, which ends up leaving a bad taste behind. Now, Chris Groff also commented on our Marvel review to say, good summary. For a limited playtest document, I can see why their mechanical focus is on smashing stuff. That, that is, for the most part, where most Marvel comic stories go anyway. They may spin their wheels a bit with personal dilemmas, but most of the time, their solution is ultimately a fight with a bad guy. Not a lot of superhero stories involve hacking computers, checking for traps, and hanging out in taverns mm. to try and charm people. So I can give a playtest rulebook a pass on that. Grid-based combat and traditional stat versus stat comparisons with characters are still what my biggest red flags are with mm -hmm. this new system. I don't care about who can win an arm wrestling contest type stats. That isn't really relevant in a superhero game. The very structured power lists also bug me. I hate games where superhero power sets are so specific. Most comics will show the heroes use their powers in all sorts of ways. Some are more linear, but others, like Spider-Man, Magneto, Storm, and Doctor Strange, get super creative. And I don't feel a list of spells really defines them well. I don't know, maybe I'm just spoiled and a tad bitter that Marvel Heroic lost the license, as that game is my Super's RPG measuring stick. Mine too. It is not without its criticisms either, but one area I feel it really did nail down is in how it defined their heroes and how that flexibility translated into play. Well, thanks, as always, for the comment, Chris. Uh, while we both realize this is a playtest, and we mentioned a lot in the review that we had limited space. Matt had limited space. We know he had limited space. But it's not, honestly, it's not the lack of non-combat options in the playtest that worries me. Like, yes, I would have liked to have seen something in there. But it's the fact that Sean actually asked Matt if we were going to see any of that, and he basically said, no, there's no out-of-combat system planned at this time. But that might change depending on the playtest feedback. 
So again, my call out to all of you, Chris included, is if anyone thinks this is a glaring omission from a superhero game, you really should fill out the playtest feedback form and let them know these are your thoughts. Well, the game honestly still doesn't really look like it's going to be for me. I'm still leaving some hope that it may just change into something in the end because of this playtest. And don't forget that's marvel.com slash RPG for the feedback. Now, next up, we've got a couple of different comments on our talk about eight different supers <laughs> RPGs, starting with David Wood, who's got some more game recommendations for me. Saw this one, couldn't pass it by. Sometime back, I did up a catalog of those superhero games on my shelves or in bags near them because the shelves won't hold anymore. <laughs> and there are a few more to consider, old and new alike. Now, Champions already got mentioned, but I have to add it's capable of a lot more than superhero action. And given that it's had literal decades of being tested by munchkins of every stripe, its latest incarnation, 6th edition, and don't get me started on the ironically named Champions Complete, is practically bulletproof, and I'm not just talking about the thickness of the books. As I've said on another occasion, about half of the Hero 6 e, uh, E's Volume 1 is power descriptions and special cases. And if you have a character that needs all of those at the same time, I want to see that build. Now, David goes on to list a number of games he thinks Sean should check out and wonders if you've read any of these. So starting with Sentinel Comics, the RPG based on the Sentinels of the Multiverse card game, which has a fun character creation system and an innovative tension mechanic. Now, personally, I've actually played this one and I enjoy it, but you haven't had the chance yet from what I know. Nope, I need to. And frankly, it's only due to the pandemic that I haven't played this and I expect <laughs> purchase it after playing. <laughs> yeah. Next, he's got Mutant City Blues, the superhero investigator from Pelgrim Press, which has a very simple combat system and a lot of mechanics and insight around finding clues. Now, this one I do know. I actually have a copy of this, and it is from the wonderful Robin D. Lots uh, of Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and uses his gumshoe system, the, the brilliant breakthrough that if you have clues in the game, just let the players find it is, is the big thing in the gumshoe system. Now, I have this, but I haven't actually read it because I read Trail of Cthulhu, and I got to say the system, that's just not the type of games I run. I don't run investigations. Yeah, no, I have absolutely looked into this, but sorry, Robin, this just isn't for me either. Yeah. Uh, I might pick it up sometime just as a completionist, but I have read up on the gumshoe system, and honestly, it does nothing for me in the way I play in games. Yeah, I feel the same way, though I do feel I should sit down and run or play a gumshoe game. Like maybe it's, I, uh, Chris was talking about Marvel Heroic and how awesome it is. I admit when I read that, it sounded terrible. So maybe gumshoe, I just need to see at the table. All right, next, Champions Now. Yes, I know I said I wouldn't have to mention Champions, but this is the Ron Edwards take on Champions, pulled from a, much of the older editions. A lot less crunchy than its namesake. Now, I wasn't aware there was actually a Champions Light, and I'm definitely going to have to take a, a peek for this one. I got to say, I'm already confused. We have three different editions of Champions here, and I don't even know what's a current one. Next, we have Wild Talents, which uses the One Roll Engine superhero game from the same people who brought you monsters and other childish things. Doesn't get a lot of love, but gosh darn it, it's innovative in character creation and action alike. Now, this one is on my wish list, but just haven't gotten around to pulling the trigger yet. Next, we have Mighty Protectors, which might not sound familiar until, you, until I tell you it's essentially the much-awaited third edition of Villains and Vigilantes. This is another game that preloads the crunch, tiling it more into character creation to make play go so easier. I really do want to give Villains and Vigilantes a try, uh, though I, this particular version appears to be PDF only, which yeah, is just not my favorite way to enjoy a game that I may actually really play uh, and not just have a reference or, you know, to be able to say I own it. Next, we have Ascendant, which I haven't had much time to play, but but it's like someone looked at Champions and thought, this needs more math. Now, I don't know why he's recommending this one to Sean. So, I actually do have this one. <laughs> wow. uh, unfortunately, I'm actually embarrassed to admit. Uh, the creator of this one is one of the problematic... People and uh, we won't be discussing this game as a result. Fair enough. Next, Galaxies in Peril, which is kind of the sequel to Worlds in Peril from the same people rather than PBTA, though GIP is FITD. 
Rather than powered by the apocalypse, Galaxy in Peril is forged in the dark. The same system as Blades in the Dark. I'm kind of glad he added that clarification. <laughs> Uh, now, this one I know you were waiting for. So when we published that eight episode, that was like your hotness. That was what you were drooling over. Yep. So it has shown up, uh, and I have been chipping away with it. But it's it's just a little weird to me and hard mm -hmm. to delve into because, in part, I've never played a Forged in the Dark game. Um, I have a copy of Blades in the Dark, and I have mm -hmm. poked at it. But, and I, so I understand the concepts, but I've never actually used them in a game so trying to get some of the, the base concepts is just taking a little extra reading. Uh, mm -hmm. I am working my way through it, though. Now, does it require Forge in the Dark like, nope, or nope, any other? So nope. it is standalone. Yeah, it's standalone. But it does seem like it might be more approachable for people who are already familiar. Yeah, with. I mean, it's just, it's basically taking all those concepts from right. Blades in the Dark and, and flip them over into a new, uh, a new sort of uh, genre. Now, this one I've heard of. Capes, Cowls, and Villains, Owl. Same people who brought you Cartoon Action Hour, the 12 based system that seems to emulate comic book action down to an editorial control system that allows the action to be rewritten at certain times. So I absolutely have this one, though only in PDF. So it always takes a lot more effort for me to go through them that way. I do love the look of this book, though. I just love the name. That's a, of all of them, that's the most brilliant name so far. <laughs> then I, I don't know if the hashtag is supposed to be here, if it's hashtag urban heroes. Pound Urban Heroes, which was originally an Italian superhero RPG in a crap sack world, think Ray Winnegar's Underground, but not played for laughs. The system is mechanically simple, but its take on powers and powering those powers is worth a look. So this one is now on my wish list. <laughs> um, once it, now that it's been pointed out to me, I hadn't heard about this one. And interestingly, this was the first time I've ever had a page on drive through RPG warn me about adult content and okay. tell me to go change my settings, um, which is how I knew it was the first time because I didn't even know there was a settings <laughs> for, you know, hiding adult content on drive through RPG. Fair enough. Uh, but I, it's on the wish list. And again, this one is in our, uh, this one is only a PDF. Uh, I suspect you could probably get the, the full copy in Italian, but I am not familiar with the language. Fair enough. So that were all the recommendations from, and I'm going to say, Ari Firo is David. <laughs> well, thank you, David. So the other comment on our Supers topic comes from Reverence Pavane, who writes, the one I run most is Champions, except I ask people to build characters with a certain level of effect and then calculate the point cost afterwards, then use that as the basis of creating the opposition. It makes it, makes it less of a game of forensic accounting. <laughs> <laughs> See right there, champions requires forensic accounting. So some other favorites are wild talents, especially in regards with some of the settings produced for it, such as Progenitor. It also has a great discussion on superhero world building. Unfortunately, I find the ore to require too much manipulation, which breaks immersion for me running or playing. Now that's the one role engine. There are a lot of great one role engine superhero games from the original godlike superheroes in World War II, Kerberos Club, Victorian superheroes, and Better Angels, where the superheroes are supervillains who don't want the real supervillains to get powers that the actual demons provide them to get. Okay. That's, that's a, yeah, I think I need a flowchart for that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it is even more manipulative since attributes slide during play in the same manner as a dirty city. And the player to your left also plays your demon. Oh, okay. well, that's an odd one. And, and I, there aren't too many games. We, 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 we almost need to do a list sometime. How many games are there that require you to sit at the same point in the table? You know, where does table position mm -hmm. on an RPG matter? Uh, so anyway, back to the comments. Uh, I started out with the original Superhero 2044 and played in lots of fun villains and vigilantes and Super Squadron campaigns and tend to use their adventures as source material. So many new ones, so little time. I think we finally found someone who's definitely more into superhero RPGs than Sean. Like just reading that, I'm like, oh yeah, there were some some sentences in there that I'm like, whoa, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's like a, a name drop of all these indie art supers <laughs> right there. I, overall, though, man, champions. There are a lot of champions fans out there. Or is it just that like the champion fans are vocal? They're like, no, everyone just calls my game crunchy and says they don't want to play it. I have to advocate for it. So anytime Champions comes up, they feel they need to speak up. And I'm not shooting you down, or Champions. They're each their own. Any game you like. I haven't played it. I can't complain. Either way. But man, so many Champions comments. So quite a list there. And within that list, much of it I've already either 
uh, already have or have dismissed. Yeah. I do have Godlike, uh, though even just a quick flip through made me somewhat lose interest. Uh, I must admit the different settings don't appeal to me as much as I tend to sandbox my super games uh, in, in specific settings worlds based off of my concepts, then combined with whatever the session zero consultation mm -hmm. with my players uh, bring up. So finally, a super awesome comment we got on our Board Game Geek about our Tales from the Loop, the board game review. Just on Board Game Geek, it's not our Board Game Geek. <laughs> well, we don't know our that. stuff on Board Game Geek. Yes. Mark at uh, Scissors on Board Game Geek writes, this is a really excellent chat. Your point about how the game makes it feel like the robots should be a massive and integral part of the game with miniatures, big machine boards, hacking counters, part of the rule book being devoted to hacking, but they often aren't, is a great point, and I really felt the same. Mm -hmm. Your other point about how you shouldn't start with bottom up yeah. and maybe never even play it, but That's to start with a light fantastic instead, which mm -hmm. is my favorite of the four scenarios I played, is such a key point as well. Now, one point about the rule book, though. At around 32 minutes, you say that the rule book is badly organized, but every question that has been asked on Board Game Geek has had the designer able to point to where the answer is in the rulebook. So the answer to every question is there. I don't think that's the case with what happens when you fail a rumor card. The rulebook should say that the card gets discarded, whether you pass or fail, but I don't believe it does. So that is something that isn't in the rulebook, unless I'm mistaken. Sure. Overall, too many great points made throughout the video to list. This is the best coverage I've seen of this game so far. Awesome job. Oh, thanks so much, Mark. That that is that made my day, my week. I'm I'm smiling about this one. That one's awesome. So I did double check the rule book, and again, I'm on time to the post it on Board Game Geek just to see if the designer can point it to me. But I did not see it. I didn't find anything in there that says what to do with the rumor cards once you investigate them. Now, personally, when we played, I think we just assumed, like like it just to me, it was you investigate the rumor, you make the check, pass or fail, the rumor's done. So we just made the assumption that's what you did. I think that's what happened, or maybe it's somewhere in there. Now, one thing I did find while trying to see if this had been asked on Board Game Geek to see if the designer had pointed anywhere is there is now finally an official FAQ out there, and this is clarified there. It very clearly states that cards all are, cards are discarded no matter the outcome. More importantly, though, the designer has talked quite a bit about the new edition of the rulebook, which is currently being worked on. Now, what I didn't see in any of this FAQ is anything that addresses the player count problems, which honestly, to me, are way bigger than these other issues. Uh, I know it would never be as popular as Gloomhaven, but man, I want to do a read through of that FAQ. I, it's <laughs> like it would take 10 seconds. Uh, is it, there, there, yeah. There's like six things he clarifies that it. That's mm -hmm. it, because both well, the rest is in the rule book. If you can find it. If you uh, can find it. But it's there. At least he's admitted the rule yep. book needs some editing and re-releasing. Yep. All right, so that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight's question comes from one of our awesome Patreon patrons, Math Guy Dave, who asks, Hey, Tabletop Bellhop, what are the best games to take on vacation? Well, so thanks for the great question, Dave, and of course, for supporting our show. A quick reminder, you can support us at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. In addition to helping us keep this show going, you also get access to behind the scenes blog posts, copies of our pre-production show notes, access to our private Discord channel, and hours of bonus audio each week. Now with that short bit of self-promotion done, let's move on to Dave's question. So great games for vacation. What kind of games are good for a vacation? Well, that's going to completely depend on what kind of vacation you are. There's lots of different ways people try to unwind. The games you bring to the beach are going to be completely different from the games you bring on a pub crawl, which are also going to be different from the games you bring to the cottage. Now, since Dave didn't specify, and I don't want to leave anything out, today's game list is going to be a little bit longer than usual, as I wanted to include games for basically any type of vacation you may be planning. If you're going to tour the Large Hadron Collider, weekend in the Antarctic, or go hyping up Mauna Kea, or more likely something a bit more local and budget-friendly. Now I feel like all of those are Tales from the Loop plots. I don't know why. Like every one, like if I ever have to run it, now I have a campaign idea. So I couldn't list every game that anyone could bring on any vacation, 
So I decided to sit back and think about all the games that I brought with us, whether it's vacation with the kids or if it's just Deanna or I, or if we're going to visit family or we're going to a beach versus going to on a pub crawl. And I looked at what the games I tightened to pack have in common. So the first thing I want in a vacation game is something quick, which is not something you usually hear from me. Now, I, this doesn't have to be like five minute games or even 30 minute games, but you and I, we probably want to save the three hour plus epic games for a regular game night at home with your regular group. And I don't know, I, I'm not going to be playing Twilight Imperium in my hotel room. Now, vacation time to me is one of those times where I am perfectly happy playing a nice quick game multiple times over and over again. Now, the one exception for this might be if you're heading to the cottage for a long haul and you want to have something meaty for a rainy day. But I think generally we're playing planning the sunny day list here. Yes. We might want a rainy day fun list at some point, other point. Yeah, I guess the one caveat is also pack a Twilight Imperium just in case <laughs> or a long epic game of choice. But no, I'm not going to be talking about those kind of games tonight. Now, the next thing I look for, which is also strange for me, is lighter games. Yes, I like brain burning games. I like heavier euros. I like long term strategy and engine builders. But that's not what I want when I'm just trying to relax and chill. When I'm on vacation, I want games that are part of an experience, not the experience. I want to be playing games on my vacation, not playing games while I'm on vacation. I want to take in where I am, socialize, enjoy the view, the crowd, the atmosphere, the drinks, the food, and the company while playing something. So for me, this is where the games, uh, the best games, have that balance of strategy uh, with lightweight and it should mean something but uh, it should mean something but not distract from the conversation or relaxation yeah i don't want something where it's going to take all of my focus not in this case now the other thing i'm looking for when i'm on a holiday is to have fun i am looking for games that are more fun and don't feel like work and while i do find heavier games rewarding in the end that's not what i want when i'm trying to relax this is the one time where party games can be great. I want to laugh, have fun, forget my troubles. The entire point of a vacation is to relax and enjoy yourself and leave your other problems behind. And light, fun, quick games do that the best. The last thing you want is to end up spending the rest of the time after the game stressing out about losing or overthinking what you could have done differently. Now, another consideration is game size um, and, and also game weight. Now, this is both due to the fact that you often don't know how big a playing surface you're going to find. Plus, you may be packing, well, you probably are packing whatever game you're bringing, unless you're doing like a road trip and you just throw it in the trunk or something. You got to worry about this. So one of the games that almost made our list tonight is Climbers. Nice, light, dexterity, not dexterity, but the stacking game that looks great on the table that I guess has some dexterity elements that I can play well sober or not but it's heavy. I don't want to throw that in my luggage, especially if I'm like paying for an onboard on a flight or something like that. So I want this to, um, I want, I want lighter games in both ways, both physically and mechanically. Yeah. Unfortunately, weight becomes a, a, a difficult topic to discuss when talking yes. about board games, because we've got our, our game physical weight of actual mass and the actual brain Mass. Yes, I, I guess I should say, game. yes, I, I want light games in both ways. I want light mass and light weight. So <laughs> purses, glove boxes, fanny packs, these are the sort of game sizes and convenience you should be thinking of, even if you don't use any of the above. Everyone knows about them as a nice reference point. Yeah. Now, the last thing I think you want to consider is player count. Um, who are you going to be with? Uh, do you expect to be hanging out with strangers and meeting new people? Like that is a thing people do. And while I'll admit it's not something my wife would ever be interested in, some people do try to set things up to get the crowd interested. And in that case, you're going to want higher player count games. If you're possibly going on a work meeting and you need something to do after the meetings and have some social time where you can socialize, that's where you might want a really simple high count player, uh, like card game or something like that. But if you're looking for a romantic giveaway with your partner, all you need are two player games. So perhaps you pick a bit of both just in case so this is one of the big variances how big is the group is it yeah. a couple's vacation a full family with six kids this can significantly shape your needs 
But now on to our vacation gaming suggestions. Okay, I know that like this is the tabletop bellhop gaming podcast, and everyone listening to this is probably into hobby board games. I don't think we have a lot of you know mom and pop family gamers who listen to our show, but I honestly think the best thing you can pack gaming wise for any trip, any vacation, is something you just leave in your glove box, carry in your purse, carry it like throw it in your denim jacket, whatever is a deck of playing cards. There are so many different games to play with a standard deck that you honestly just can't go wrong. And most families already have their own personal favorites that they like to play. Personally, mine are hearts and spades. And if you're into it, toss in a crib board if that's your thing. Or one of the things my parents used to love to do is when they were on vacation is pick up a crib board wherever they went that tended to be some gaudy, geeky, thematic, wherever they happen to be crib board, like a Niagara Falls one that actually drops down or something like that. Now, to mix things up, and this is something that I would want to do, is to, before you leave for your trip, Learn a new card game. There are thousands out there. There's Hoyle Book of Games, and now that we have the internet, you can easily find a thousand trick-taking games. That way, you can at least keep things fresh and interesting so it's not sitting down to play the game you've all played a hundred times before. And that was a deck of cards. Now, sticking with the theme of cards and card games that come in small boxes, we're going to have a few of these. My first is The Game from Pandasaurus. Yes, the name is terrible. Now, this is one that Dan and I have now gotten into the habit of always taking with us on a trip. This is a difficult to win, but easy to learn cooperative game that is easy to teach to non-gamers. Like in, in reality, all you're doing is counting. All you're trying to do is play the cards in order from one to 100 or 101 in a couple different stacks with one of every number in the deck. The basic concept becomes interesting because you have a small hand of cards and you're forced to play at least two a turn, even if they're big numbers apart. We really dig the game. This has become a new favorite of ours. And honestly, it takes up very little room. Like the, the box holds a deck of cards split in two. You could easily put those together and dish the box to save a few more millimeters and a couple pounds. Well, not pounds, <laughs> a couple grams. <laughs> and that was just to be confusing. That game is the game. The game. Uh, note, I did not put The Mind on this list, which is another one from Hana, from, from the same publisher, from Pandasaurus, because I don't think it's social. It's a game about sitting in silence and playing cards, and I don't think that's what you want. Unless maybe you're on a meditative retreat for your vacation, then maybe you might want to consider that. So next, I've got another great cooperative small box card game, and that is Hanabi. Now, this one's funky, as you don't get to look at your own cards. The game is all about giving each other clues and interpreting those clues to build stacks of cards in different colors that go up one number at a time. Now, this is just even easy enough that you can still hang out and chat while playing, but has enough depth that even get hardcore gamers tend to dig it. Now, one thing to watch for is if you've got an all-inclusive trip, the memory elements of this game are going to get more difficult as the game goes on. And if you play it strictly according to the no table talk rules, you're probably not going to win, um, mm -mm. possibly ever. Um, and that could get stressful depending on the kind of vacation and the kind of personality you have. But depending on you, that is Hanabi. Next, I have the Sushi Go games. This is both Sushi Go and Sushi Go Party. For gamers, I recommend Party, though it does take up a bit more space and is a bigger box and a little heavier. Uh, this is a quick playing drafting game where you're passing cards and trying to collect different sets of sushi. Each type of sushi scores differently, where like one suit might want you to get three. Once like, you get so many points for every three, where another might give you one point per card and so on. This is a good one for families with kids and for non-gamers as well. And the art tends to draw people in. And uh, there is the uh, uh, Sushi Go Extra. extra there's, a, there's a newer version, which is the better one to pick up rather than just plain Sushi Go. Sushi Go uh, Party. Party, yeah, party. what I said. Oh, it is. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sushi Go Party is the more gamers game. Yeah. Sushi gets a little lighter and a little easier to carry. And that was Sushi Go Party. Next, the codename games. I know I'm kind of cheating here, right? I'm, I'm grouping some games, but to be honest, these just fit. This is a series of games, includes code names, duet, pictures, as well as a bunch of themed versions like Marvel and Disney. With each version, the, the well, sorry, which version you want is honestly going to depend on what kind of vacation you're going on and who you're going to be playing with. Right, Marvel and Disney are going to be perfect for family trips, whereas Duet is a fantastic date night game. Now, if you are expecting larger groups, stick with the original code names. Whereas if you actually end up on a couple's date or a, a couple's 
Night Duet works great as a cooperative game. There are honestly enough versions of this word guessing game that there's probably a perfect perfect version of code names for your trip. And that was code names. All of them. Any of them. <laughs> Just pick one. Or two. Next, no thanks. This is the perfect travel game when you're worried about space. It's a tiny box, doesn't take up a lot of room when playing. You just got a single set of cards, fairly small deck, and some poker chips, but like the little tiny style poker chips. In this game, you're trying not to collect cards, but you're going to get stuck with some, and you only score the lowest card in a series of numbers. So if we have a run, you only score the lowest number. So if you are going to collect cards, trying to make sure they're in a run. Um, it's really simple. You get past a card and you either have to take it or you say no thanks and put a chip on it. If you're out of chips, you're forced to take the card. That's pretty much it. This is honestly one of the best gateway games out there. This is fantastic for hooking some new gamers, as well as being good enough that even experienced groups like to play this on a relaxed game night or a filler. This is almost a must have in anyone's collection. And that is, sorry, <laughs> no thanks. <laughs> It is going to be a two out of hour episode of Sean's not paying attention. Bonanza or bean, as we like to call it, is one I often pack for a trip. If I know I'll be meeting up with other gamers, like going to a con or just knowing it's a geeky event or a comic con. Well, I did say a con. I guess gaming con, comic con, pop culture con, any of those. This is an easy to teach, quick playing, high player count set collection game that is actually more about negotiation and trading than long term strategy. The oddest part about this game, and the one thing that this is why I don't recommend it all the time for non-gamers, is there's a rule that you can't sort your hand of cards, and people have a real hard time with that. This is one you don't want for that after the work meeting meetup, because once people start drinking, they just automatically start shuffling stuff and, and sorting their cards in order. I have had so many players mess that up. So I honestly usually save this for at least somewhat experienced gamers. And that is Bean, otherwise known as Bonanza. Bonanza. Now, Red 7, this is a bit meatier than the other ones mentioned above and requires a bit more thinking when playing with the full rules. Now, it's still not what I consider complex, but it may be a bit much for kids or non-gamers. Now, the basic premise here is simple. At the end of your turn, you have to be winning. If it's your turn and you're not winning, play a card to change the rules. Now, while individual rounds of Red 7 can take minutes, uh, possibly even seconds, toss in the scoring rules and the variant card abilities for a longer experience, great for filling gaps between various vacation functions. And that is Red 7. Next, I have Yardmaster, which I have to thank Deanna for reminding me of to put on this list. Yardmaster is a train game where you're building freight trains using cards. It's almost like a card version of Ticket to Ride in that way, because you're discarding cards of different colors to collect train cards of the same colors you discarded, except you're not actually worried about routes. You're not worried about where your train's going. You're just building one train. Now, the neat bit here is that each car added to your train has to be either the same color or the same number as the card before it, and that you can store cards if they don't fit to be added to your train later, which can lead to some really fulfilling combos. And that is Yardmaster. Now, another one Deanna gets credit for is Walking in Burano. And I got to say, as soon as she said this one, I'm like, wow, what a perfect theme for a vacation game, especially if you happen to be going to Venice. Though in this game, you're actually the Venice planner for a group of buildings in Venice trying to make it as appealing as possible for both the locals and tourists. Build the colorful buildings of Burano while collecting scoring cards for distinct features, like what kind of flowers you have or how many cats are hanging around. If you play your cards right, Santa may even come visit your block, but only if you've got the most chimneys. And that is Walking in Burano. You. Wow. While there are games we mentioned so far are good for groups, most of them aren't great for a trip where there are just two of you. So here are some specific two-player games we think would be great to bring on vacation. All right, my first two-player game that I, I put on every two-player game list is The Duke. This is still our personal favorite. This is our favorite two-player game as well as our favorite two-player vacation game. It's got a small footprint. It's easy to clean pieces, which can be important, something we didn't mention earlier. And it has engaging chess-like gameplay that keeps us coming back time and time again. 
Now, this is an abstract strategy game where your pieces are two-sided tiles. Now, there's no memorizing moves needed here as each tile shows right on it how to move each piece. The neat bit here, the really brilliant bit part, is that once you move a tile, you have to flip it over to the other side, which usually has a completely different set of moves on the other side. And this game is fantastic for people of all ages. My son loves this game and, and, rec and requests it all the time. That is The Duke. Now, another chess-like game we both enjoy a lot is Onitama. Now, this one's lighter and quicker than The Duke, but can actually be more thinky and more cerebral as it's all about completely open information from start to finish. In this abstract strategy game, there are five cards in play and each card shows how you move your pieces. Now, the neat bit here is that you start with two cards, your opponent has two cards and there's one in the middle and after you make a move, they take that card from the middle and the other one goes to the middle and you end up having to hand the move you just used over to your opponent. So you really have to plan ahead and be careful, you're not helping the other player more than you're helping yourself with your moves. And that was Onitama. Now, Lost Cities is a Rainier Nitsia card game that Deanna and I actually played when we were dating um, as the coffee exchange downtown where we like to meet had a copy of the game. Now, this is a somewhat mathy card game where you're trying to make sets of cards played into a tableau where you have to make sure they go into ascending order. You can only play a card if it's higher than the card that's already there. Now, this can be difficult because there's only one of each card in the deck and you're both competing over the same cards. Now, it also includes a rather neat push your luck betting element where you can basically bet that you're going to do really well in one color or another, and then you're going to score really well or be punished if you manage to complete that expedition, as they're called, or not. While this is an older game, it really does still stand the test of time. Though do not pick up the four-player version Rivals. Yes, this is Lost Cities not, I can stress, not Lost City Rivals. I think now it's named Lost Cities, the classic card game. And the latest version actually comes with a sixth expedition, which is an optional new color you can add to it to make the card counting and math even harder. Next, I have The Fox in the Forest. This is a two-player trick-taking card game that honestly, like I, when I heard two-player trick-taking, I'm like, come on, that, that can't work. But it does, and it works really well. I had my doubts completely at first, but after one play, I was sold. Now, like most trick-taking games, playing well is a mix of bluffing, card counting, and playing the odds. Now, neat bits here include a system where you want just the right amount of tricks. If you take too few, your opponent wins the round. But if you take too many, you bust, and your opponent wins that way too. So you need to go for the middle ground. Now, if the two of you prefer cooperative rather than competitive games, which I totally get, pick up the Fox in the Forest duet instead. It shares some similar mechanics, but is a cooperative trick-taking game. That is the Fox in the Forest and or the Fox in the Forest duet. Now, credit for this one goes to Sean, and I probably should let him talk about that this one, but that is Jaipur. This is a very solid two-player game about trading goods and camels. You manage your hand, excuse me, managing your hand of goods and turning in sets of goods to collect tokens. Now, the more cards you put in your set, the more tokens you get, with like the four, fives, and six being really good. But the tokens drop in value the more that are bought, which leads to the interesting choice of whether to sell early and take tokens while they're high value, or save up so you have lots of goods so you get lots of tokens. This is actually considered one of the best two-player only games of all time with multiple awards under its belt. And you can get some fantastic digital versions of this as well. So you can get it on your on phone and do pass and play type stuff as well. And that is Jaipur. Next, we have some bigger board games. Uh, while still being pretty easy, fairly quick and somewhat small, these may be better suited to a hotel room or a night at the cabin instead of at the beach or at a winery. So first up is Porkle. This is a fantastic mass market tile placement game that is like Scrabble with shapes and colors and without a board. At least that's how I usually describe it to non-gamers. This is a great family weight game with enough strategy to keep hobby gamers happy as well. If you're worried about space, you can also pick up Travel Quirkle with it needs a smaller footprint as the original game can spread quite far depending on how players place their tiles. And that is Quirkle or Travel Quirkle. 
Note there is also Quirkle Cubes, which I enjoy, but it takes up more space. It's bigger, and again, we're looking for smaller stuff. Next, I have Splendor, which is a great gateway engine building game. One of the great things about this game is how portable it can be as long as you throw out the original box. A few tiles, a deck of cards, and some really sweet poker-like chips is all you need to play Splendor. You're going to collect chips and then turn them in to buy cards that themselves provide you with free gems that you can use each turn to buy better cards that provide you with more gems that'll let you buy better cards that are worth points that also you can collect sets of to try to score some nobles. That's honestly pretty much it. Uh, this is a ridiculously popular game with the list of awards on here is honestly so long that on my monitor, I can't see it all at once. I have to scroll up and down to see all the awards. Yeah, I, some people uh, are, are probably over Splendor. I know some people yeah. sort of get sick of it, but I still uh, definitely enjoy it. That is Splendor. Now, there are expansions for it. I know I haven't tried any, but if you are tired of it, that might be a way to keep it interesting. Next, I have another series of games because Ticket to Ride New York was a one of, like, honestly, my biggest surprise. Whatever year that came out, whatever year I got, I think it was 2019 because I first played it on New Year's. Um, for the first time I ever played the game, Sean had come down and we broke it out. And I'm like, this was a gift from my sister-in-law. And it's not that I'm saying she bought a bad gift, but I wasn't expecting it to be nearly as good as it was. This is a, I was shocked by how good it was from our first play. This is a Ticket to Ride game that's much smaller, much quicker, but still gives you that feel of Ticket to Ride, of, of taking the risk on getting routes and pushing your luck and stealing routes and cutting people off and so on. Now, I found New York also the best way, in my opinion, to play Ticket to Ride two players. Though it does play one to four, or sorry, two to four. There's no solo rules that I know of. So I, I dig it because I do not like Ticket to Ride two players in the full game. It's just the board's too open. Now, since playing New York, another of a uh, number, sorry, a number of other games have come out in this series, which includes London, Amsterdam, and the very soon to be released Ticket to Ride San Francisco which seems to have a nice pride theme to it. You've got a rainbow logo on the top. So I got to say the art looks like it might also be going for the hippie 60s look too. But that one's not even out yet. It will be as all of these are a ticket, a ticket to ride, no, a Target exclusive. Ticket to Target. A Ticket to Target exclusive for the first few months, but you'll be able to get it everywhere. And I mean, personally, I don't like Ticket to Ride. I, I will never play Ticket, never, never, eagerly ask to play Ticket to Ride, although I will begrudgingly play it if offered. Uh, but Ticket to Ride New York was great because it's Ticket mm -hmm. to Ride in 15, 15 minutes or less, yeah. which means you don't have to, even if you don't like it, it's still over quickly. <laughs> so it's fine. Well, there's, uh, there's, there's a shining review. It was, it, it really was a, a surprising game. Again, it was yeah. a 2018 release. And again, 2019, I think uh, January 2019 is when we first played it. And it really yeah, was so. an enjoyable game because it was quick you you don't even if you don't like ticket to ride you don't have time to not like this game it's just <laughs> fun and quick you don't have time to not like there there isn't a unique perspective on why the game's actually fun because you don't have to play it too long hey whatever works i'll admit it i dig it i actually really like new york i, I that's another one of those ones where i've sold copies because i basically show it to people and like wow that really is good uh, next, I have one that I'm sure everyone in the chat's been waiting for me to mention. mention. They just weren't sure where it was going to be in here, and that is the Azul series of games. This is one that Deanna and I do tend to bring with us on trips. Uh, what we're still looking to pick up at some point is a two-player player mat um, that'll fit nice on a bar. Um, this is also the go-to game for our friends Tori and Kat to bring to the cottage. Azul is now their cottage game. Uh, this is an abstract tile laying game that one, is one of the most well-balanced and elegant games in my collection. The fact that it has fantastic components, honestly, is just icing on the cake. Now, well, I recommend the original Azul for the average group of players, especially families. If you do like a bit more meat, check out Summer Pavilion. Or if you want just a bit of brain burn, look for Stained Glass of Sintra. Now, if that's not heavy enough, early reviews are in indicating that the latest Azul game, Queen's Garden, is by far the heaviest of the bunch. Now, I personally haven't had a chance to try that one yet to see where it falls on my personal scale. Of all of those so far, Summer Pavilion is my favorite. Yeah, I, I have to say, right, given, given the choice, I will actually default to the basic Azul, you know, straight Azul mm -hmm. Azul. 
Uh, but uh, and, and stained glass of Sintra just hasn't done it for me. And also, I don't really know how well that one would travel as well as some of the other ones, too. Yeah, it's got, got the, all the separate cards, all the little and... cards and things. But those are the games of Azul. Next, I have another classic. Uh, what I like about this list is we're we're gonna we're gonna go the gamut from from old classics to somewhat new hotness. Um, San Juan. This is the Puerto Rico card game, which I don't even know if it's met, uh, sold that way. At the time, Puerto Rico was the number one game in the world, so it was, of course, this the Puerto Rico card game. I don't know if that's still, but San Juan. This is one of the first games to feature multi-use cards. Honestly, it might be the first. I don't actually know where your hand of cards not only represent your buildings that you can build but also the resource you have to pay to build things. So you're like, if I want to build the market, I got to discard these four other buildings, but you know what? I really want this building for later. And that's always been a fascinating decision. Now to this day, this is one of the best action selection games out there where you're going to pick a role and everyone else gets to do something based on the role you picked. These mechanics are going to sound familiar because so many games have built off on this. This is one of the like gateway foundation tableau builders. Now, I'll admit, personally, I prefer Race for the Galaxy, which is an evolution of this. San Juan, though, is much more portable with a smaller box, less cards, and simpler rules. So, in my opinion, belongs on this list more than Race does, even though I do prefer Race. And the uh, second edition box claims the card game based on the highly acclaimed strategy game, Puerto Rico. So and it's still is... there, but it's not like part of the name anymore. And that is San Juan. All right, I said we're going to have some new games on here. So that, this is probably the newest game on the list, which is Land versus Sea. And honestly, I was thinking old and crusty at the time because when I was working on this list, I almost put Carcassonne here. But then Deanna reminded me about Land versus Sea, which we have said pretty much like in a way kills Carcassonne. For your basic tile laying game, this is a better one. Now, this is my go-to light, relaxing tile laying game. One of the best things about Land versus Sea is the various ways to play both at different player counts and mixing and matching the three optional rule modules. If it's just you and the kids, just play the place game. If you got a group of gamers gathering together, toss in the trade routes, the mountains and coral, and the waypoints. Now, another highlight is just how well this game plays at all player counts, with actually the team version would be perfect for playing adults versus the kids, or if you're going on a trip with someone else, couple versus couple. And that is land versus sea. Now, since I didn't put Carcassonne on, I felt I still had to pick something from that era, so I decided to include Alhambra. Now, similar to Splendor, this is another game that can be condensed down to a pretty small package once you toss out the box and the insert. Now, Alhambra is a classic game that still fascinates me because still nothing else has done a market like Alhambra has. It's almost auction-like, where you're, you're going to pay your money, but if you pay exact, you get to go again, and you can overbid, but you lose the money. Like, there's some neat stuff going on there. And then it's got unique tile placement rules with the walls and then the variable timing scoring system. More games need that where you're like, you know, how about one third of the way through the deck, you're going to score sometime, but you don't know when. Not enough games use that. This is a game that honestly, every time I play it, I'm like, man, we should play Alhambra more often. Man, Alhambra is good. Why don't we play Alhambra more often? Now, if you do ever get sick of the core game, there are a ton of expansions out there. And if you're actually somehow new to Alhambra and never actually got to check it out, what I recommend is looking for the big boxes because you'll get the big game and like eight of those expansions all in one. Though I have to say, if you do pick up the newest, which is actually Alhambra, the mega box, it's probably not all that portable for your vacation. No, I would just bring the base game, I would think. <laughs> yes, sorry. I, I probably should have been more clear. Do not pile the, it, it's like, you know, the, we'll do the Marvel United. That's what you should bring on vacation is Marvel United with all the expansion packs. It'll keep you busy for months and months on and, your and vacation. And cost you $1,000 in luggage uh, fees. Yes, in luggage. Well, they're light enough. <laughs> that one was Alhambra. Getting a little distracted there. Next, I have the Unlock Games, another group of games. It works well, right? Because these, these are, uh, the, the credit here goes to Deanna for this because I hadn't even considered these. Now, as soon as she said unlock, I'm like, oh, what about exit? I'm like, oh, no, wait, actually, most of the escape room games have fiddly bits. They have lots of little components, um, stuff you have to cut out, or you might need scissors or glue or tape to even be able to complete them. The unlock games, you need a phone or tablet and the deck of cards that comes with the game. Now, this is another one where you could easily pack up a game or two or three, like pick up, sorry, go buy like one, two or three of the unlock games and then just take the card decks 
I would just throw them into Ziploc baggies and be able to bring three, six, or 12 adventures with you because you get three in a box when you buy these now. They used to be separate, but now when you buy an unlock game, you get three separate adventures at three different difficulties. And literally all you need is these tarot-sized cards to be able to play. Uh, they also have the advantage of being able to play solo, which is something we didn't really highlight on this list, but you may be going to vacation on your own, or you might need something to do while the kids are gone swimming. And that is the unlock games. All right, we're at the end of my list tonight. My final game is a role-playing game, because here at Tabletop Bellhop, we're not just about board games. Now, in general, you probably don't want to bring a full traditional RPG with you on vacation, unless maybe that vacation is to go to a game con. Most RPGs require a lot of books and other ephemera, like dice, minis, scenery, and who knows what else, spell books and spell trackers and dice jails and whatever other things you use in your games. The game I recommend is For the Queen. This is an improv style role playing game that fixes this problem by being a single deck that's pretty much the size of your standard Rider White tarot card deck. You get the deck and the box, and that's it. Includes everything you need to play, including all the rules, which are just on cards. Now, besides being highly portable, For the Queen is my favorite improv RPG experience. And I just love the way that you start off in the game kind of fumbling around answering your questions and not really knowing how, you, how to answer. But then at the end of the game, you end up having this like fleshed out detailed character that you end up caring a lot about. And you usually have a very solid opinion on what you think of the queen by the end of the game. And that was for the queen. Although now that you mention that, I have to say two dice and like 10 sheets of paper and you can have a full game of masks as long as your gm is experienced you, you don't have to have everything memorized i was thinking about you know what like well, no, when I was as long as this... the other sheets your, your character sheet contains pretty much everything you ever yeah, need as a PBTA player is pretty good for that. and and the the gm just has to know all the all the rules and maybe you know one sheet of the basic um the basic rules to get to be able to hand out see i was also thinking laser and feelings or our, our personal favorite var variant of rocker boys and vending machines there you go. which is literally a one page rpg yeah. and all you need is 1d6 so there are others out there but i picked one that i own that i would bring well as we like to do for all these game recommendation lists we also have three honorable mentions for you tonight all right number one uh, this one number one honorable mention this was funny because i'm working on this list tonight and i took some time to wander around my game room looking for great games to bring on a trip that i might not have thought of when sitting here at my desk and looking through my bgg collection and googling what other people put on their list while doing this i spotted a small box card game on my pile of shame well technically it's above my miniature display case it's sitting up there with a bunch of other small box things and i'm like brew crafters and when did i get that this is brew crafters the travel card game or brew crafters travel card game from dice hate me games now, Brew Crafters is a, a medium to heavy Euro about brewing beers. Well, they put out a travel version. I had totally forgotten about this game. And honestly, how have we not brought this on a trip? Like, like what Deanna and I tend to do on our trips is go to breweries and brew pubs where we're, we're old, we're, I don't know, we're, we're beer grognards. We're, we're, I don't think we're cool enough to be hipsters, so we got to be something. Um, and and we, we sit at breweries and like, how can we not be in a brew pub and playing a game about brewing craft beer. Like, how did we miss this? Now, I actually sat down and read the rules for the game, and honestly, it sounds like a light, quick, playing, solid game. So I feel confident tossing it in the honorable mentions. Now, this is going to be one of our quickest turnovers on honorable mentions, because I'm bringing this with us tomorrow. So we're going to be playing this in a brewery, most likely the Banded Groups Brewery, and you'll get to hear about next week if it uh, belongs to have a spot further up on the list. Well, that is Brew Crafters, the travel game. And I think one of the reasons why uh, a lot of people don't necessarily know about it is fans of Brew Crafters are used to a game that's a weight of 3.57, yes. whereas Brew Crafters, the travel card game, is a 1.32. Yeah, so they definitely sound... aim at different markets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that is Brew Crafters, the travel card game. Yes. The, the original you don't want to bring. It's a big box and it's heavy. There is a lot of cardboard in that box, but you get these awesome little six pack tokens that you collect. It's awesome. All right. My next honorable mention is I'm going to word this this way on purpose. The Settlers of Catan Travel Edition, because it's the old printing with the old owners where every game wasn't just Catan. This was from Cosmos. Yes. Thames and Cosmos Catan game. This is a small box portable version of Catan that comes with this really nice plastic board. 
the board has bumps on it that are the numbers and you get little tiny hexagonal tiles that you slot into this to create your terrain. And then there's all kinds of holes to peg in your cities, roads, and villages. You even get little tiny um, port tiles that actually slot into the right spots. This is a fantastic small footprint version of Catan that is like so close to exact to the original. The only thing you can't do is you can't randomize the numbers. That's the one problem with this compared to the rest of them. And the desert's always in the middle. So it's just like, but it's so close. You get the full Catan experience, just tiny. Now, the reason this isn't on the main list is this is long, long, long out of print. Though I did notice like Noble Knight has some copies and they're on eBay. And I've been in game stores that had a copy of this still on their shelves. So I think it's still out there. So now this was followed up by Catan Traveler. Again, new printing. This seems like an even better vacation game because it's a fold up hex that folds into a carrying case and it has compartments to hold other cards and playing pieces and even a little dice tray that you take out. And like these compartments come off, so you hold the cards and they have like a clip on the top. So like if you're at a, on, on a windy beach, they're not going to blow away. The thing is the train set. There's no randomization. You're going to be playing on the same Catan board with the same numbers with the same terrain in the same place every time. And well, this one is also out of print and you're not going to be able to find it. But if you can find either, I actually recommend the older one for gameplay, the newer one for better for vacationing, if that makes sense. Yeah, and it's actually uh, Catan Traveler Compact Edition is the newer version. Um which is still, again, probably out of print. 2015 was the last print. Yeah, as far as I could tell, it, it seems to be gone. So Catan, uh, the Settlers of Catan Portable Edition or Catan Traveler Compact Edition, if you there get you your go. hands on them. My final honorable mention is, again, their series of games, and that is the tiny epic games from Gameling Games. The entire point of these games is to give you a big box game feel and a smaller package with shorter player time which makes these perfect travel games for hobby board gamers. Now, the reason I put these down in the honorable mentions is that I haven't loved any of these games. Like they're okay, but to me, they're just a bit too heavy to be light, fun vacation games, but they're not meany enough to like scratch the, I played a nice epic game feel. Like for me, every one I played, I'm like, I'd rather just go play a bigger game. Like instead of tiny epic galaxies, let's, let's go play eclipse. Or if I'm on vacation, or like, well, you're I'm playing Tiny Epic Galley is a little fiddly. Like, give me something a little more fun. So it just they don't hit the sweet spot for me. But I think especially the like the cabin games, the the the, the possibly at, at, at uh, like a board game cafe or something like that, where you have a table. And if you're into heavier games, this, they might scratch the itch for you. They're just not for me. And there are a lot of tiny epic games out there yes. for you to try. Right now, Tiny Epic Vikings just launched on Kickstarter at the time we're recording this episode. It like launched this week. And I think, that's the latest one. I think, yeah. And the, the, the most recent to retail is Tiny Epic Pirates, I believe. Yeah, that sounds about right. So that's it for our gaming vacation suggestions. Hopefully you found something new to bring with you on your next trip. If we missed any of your favorite games, be sure to let us know about them in the comments below. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or hit me up on social media. Welcome to our review of the retail version of Garinto plus the five player expansion and Kickstarter extras. Thank you, Grand Gamers Guild, for sending us a Kickstarter copy of Garinto as a thanks for our Garinto Kickstarter preview. Now, Garinto was designed by Richard Yanner and features artwork by Josh Capel. It was published last year by Grand Gamers Guild here in North America after a rather successful Kickstarter. Now, Garinto plays one to four players, four or five with the expansion, with games taking about an hour max. Now, Garinto has a manufactured suggested retail price of $49.99 US, which honestly is quite good for the amount of plastic you get in this box. The fifth player expansion is just under $10, and the Kickstarter Extra Set, which includes the Dragon Tiles mini expansion, is just under 9 bucks. Now, both of these add-ons can only be picked up directly from Grand Gamers Guild. You won't be able to find them on your usual online stores or, unfortunately, at your FLGS. But wait, there's more. We have a special bonus for you. 
for the entire month of May 2022 if yes. you head over to Grand Gamers Guild and use the code BELLHOP, all one word, you can get the Kickstarter version of Garinto along with the fifth player expansion for only $44.99. Unfortunately, this offer is only valid in the U.S. Sorry, fellow Canadians. Now, some of you may be thinking, didn't you guys already review Garinto before? And you would be right. Sort of. Now, this is our first time reviewing the final production version of Garinto and its expansion content. Back in February of 2020, when the Garinto Kickstarter was still going strong, we did release a preview, a prototype review of Garinto, and while many elements of the game are unchanged, we thought there was enough to talk about to warrant a follow-up review. Yeah, I really want to highlight a couple things that weren't in our original copy or have been upgraded. And I want to talk about the Dragon Tiles, the five-player expansion, and some rule variants, as well as the solo mode, which didn't exist in our preview. And then there's, of course, the fact that I want to talk about Garinto because we're the unofficial ambassadors of Garinto because we're constantly trying to get more people to try this great game, and I just love talking about it. Now, once again, we have received review copies of this game, but I personally gave money on Kickstarter because I believed in it. We're not paid for this. We just really have loved this game that much. Yeah, actually, we didn't. We received prototypes of this game. Now, for those of you learning about this game for the first time, Garinto is an abstract tile drafting game where players are trying to build their knowledge of the five elements by selecting tiles from the path and moving them onto the mountain. You then remove tiles based on the element of the tile you placed and your existing knowledge of that element. Now, all of this is being done to score points based on your growing knowledge levels and randomized scoring cards. To get a look at the very well-made components in Garinto, check out our unboxing video on YouTube. Now, note that this unboxing video does feature the Kickstarter version of the game, so a couple of the components have been upgraded. The round marker is thick plastic, the first player marker is metal, and we do have the dragon tiles. And I also have the five-player expansion, so that's in the box as well. Note, you can purchase a Kickstarter upgrade kit directly from Grand Gamers Guild, but you can't just buy the Kickstarter version on its own. Yeah, and that upgrade kit is only available through Grand Gamers Guild. While you can find the base game and at your usual online game stores, friendly local game stores, but I honestly still have not seen anywhere selling the upgrade kit, and the same goes for the five-player expansion. It seems like you can only get the base game unless you go direct to the source. Now, getting back to component quality, it's great. Uh, the highlight being the various element tiles. Uh, these are plastic. Like They remind me of the board game Upwards, if you've ever played that, a Scrabble variant. They stack together really nice. They're bright colored. They include symbols on them in case color combinations are problematic for people with vision issues. All the cardboard is nice and thick. Everything's well punched. The cards are in quality. And you get a multitude of languages in the box. So only one actually matter for us, but it's nice to have all of the various gold cards in multiple languages. While there is part of me that wishes, like upwards, you got a nice little plastic tray to stack things on, I fully understand that can't be done at the $50 price point. Now, that being said, it's not perfect. And later, we'll get to some of the less than perfect parts of it that we're hoping sees its way to a second printing to fix. But for now, let's move on to an overview of play. So the first thing you do in a game of Garinto is build what you call the mountain. This is a five by five grid of tiles that are placed on the main board. Now, the standard mountain pattern is a stack of four tiles in the middle, surrounded by a stack of three tiles, surrounded by a stack of two tiles. Now, the rule book also includes other patterns you can try out, including a wave and a depression. Now, everyone selects a player power, takes a player board in that color, and places their scoring marker on zero. Next, scoring cards are randomized. There's two different types of these. You have key element cards, which is one for each of the five different elements in the game. You're going to shuffle it and put two face up on the board. Then you're going to draw two goal cards. There are way more of these. I didn't count how many, sorry. You're going to shuffle those and put those into play. Now, these tell you what you're going to score during the game with the key element cards giving you points at the end of the game, and it's all based on how many tiles you have of that element, and the goal scoring cards, which you're going to score every season, each round of the game. Now, these include all kinds of things like scoring your highest stack of tiles or scoring your lowest stack twice or scoring only your even stacks or scoring your middle stack or getting three points for having the lowest in each color and so on. 
So this is really kind of the magic sauce of Garinto. Mm -hmm. That randomized scoring message, each game really kind of, of kind of pulls all the concepts together and makes it work as a game that you just want to keep playing. Now, once everyone read and understands the scoring cards, go through them multiple times. That's my pro tip. Make sure everyone knows what you're going to score at the game. You, you then start playing. Now, each round starts by filling the path. This is an area around the mountain that's going to hold 10 random tiles. Now, these tiles go at the end of each row and each column. Now, each turn, each player is going to select one of those tiles in the path and move it onto the mountain, placing it on one of the stacks in the same row or column the tile came from. They then draw tiles off the mountain based on what element they used, with each element having its own unique pattern. Void has you take tiles diagonally adjacent to where you played. Wind has you select orthogonally adjacent. Fire has you take tiles in the same row, whereas water has you taking from the same column. Actually, I think I got those back. Fire's this way, water's that way, because fire fires up and water flows left to right. Earth lets you take tiles from under the tile you placed. Now, it sounds a bit daunting to hear it this way, but as soon as you sit down in front of the board, it's mm -hmm. a really quite straightforward mechanic, even if it leads to gameplay, but it's hardly simple. Now, this is one, while I was working on writing this, I said to Deanna, I'm like, this is way too hard to describe when it's not there. When people are there, it's simple. I just pick up a fire, I put it, and I go, you get these. If you pick up this, you do this. And I will note that the mountain board does have a graphical reference right there for people who do forget. It's very clear and graphical, not text. So like you don't have to read anything and just look at it. Now, the number of tiles you're going to draft. So you're moving your tile from the path to the mountain. What, the number you get to draw is based on your existing knowledge in that element plus one. So a max of four tiles for all elements but Earth. Now, knowledge, we keep mentioning your knowledge. Well, your knowledge is the number of tiles you already have in that element. So my knowledge in fire, if I've collected two fire tiles already, means my knowledge is two, and when I'm drawing, I get my knowledge plus one, so I get to draw three tiles when I play a fire. That makes sense, I hope. Now, all tiles drafted are, of course, placed on your player board, which increases your knowledge. So every round, you're going to get new tiles, and your knowledge is going to go up. And this is part of the gotcha mechanics, is the more you collect, the more you have to take the next time, and you might not want nope. as many as you're going to have to take based on your knowledge. Yeah, it totally depends on the scoring cards that are out. Some games, you just want to collect all you want. But most, you're trying to get evens or odds or you're going to score your lowest and your highest. So you're trying to get a balance, which is part of the brilliance of the game. Now, the game continues until there are less tiles left on the path than the number of players. Pretty simple, right? This triggers the end of the round. Any remaining tiles on the path are removed from the game. All players score those two gold cards. Start player token is passed to the right. And the game continues. Now, a game is played for a total of four full rounds. At the end of the final round, everyone scores those key element cards, which are worth two points for every tile you've collected in those colors. Player with the most points wins. And four rounds actually in, is four seasons or one year in this game. Yes. Yep. So, and all of that is played on, under an hour, depending, depending on player count and, and setup and, and teach and such like that. But even AP, a pretty bad, this game can have pretty bad AP, but it doesn't tend to push it past that hour mark. Now, I will admit with the five player expansion, things do get a little longer. Now, with only two players, there's, of course, a special set of rules, but honestly, they're not that bad in this one. All it is is that after you take your turn, another tile is going to be removed from the path. Now, there are two ways to do this. The default is to use the burrow tokens, where it's randomly going to determine which goes off, or you can do it through player choice. Nope, that's totally new. When we played the prototype, it was always player choice. So it's kind of cool that there's a borrow token to make things simpler where it's just random. So I do dig that because that didn't exist originally. Now, Garinto also comes with solo rules where you're going to play against Kitsune, who is a fox spirit. In general, you play the game as normal for you. Like you take your turns normal, you play everything the same. Now, after each of your turns, there's this system of tiles and tokens that tells you which tiles Kitsune takes which is always a minimum of four because Kitsune is a spirit and she has unlimited knowledge of all five elements. Now your score is going to be based on those key elements and goals. Kitsune though is just collecting as many tiles as they can and is going to score the two regular key elements as well as two other random elements at the end of the game. Note, Kitsune does not score goals at all. With the added solo and the purchasable five-player expansion, this game 
really does hit a lot of groups needs mm -hmm. and unlike some games is fun and challenging playing at these various player counts these aren't just thrown on the box to sell more copies to more groups yeah we've often complained about games having player counts in the box that really don't fit the gameplay and that is not the case here now sean mentioned um various player counts there's also some variant rules there's other things to change it up so one of the ones rules, one of my favorites that I actually use every time I play is what's called compassionate turn order. This throws a, a catch up mechanic in the game. What it does is it has players going in the order of lowest score to highest score instead of just going clockwise from the start player. And there's a nice set of the one through five tokens to track that just so you don't forget. Now there's also a partnership mode, which is fascinating because it's a two on two team version of play where the goal cards are shared by adjacent players. So you actually put them between you. So me and this opponent are sharing this goal and me and that opponent are sharing that goal. That's neat. But then there's this added bonus. Whenever you draft any tiles, you have to give one to your partner. And again, sometimes you don't want tiles. And that's all just in case the five different basic player variation groups weren't enough. Yes. Now, my favorite variant in Garinto, and this is another one that was new at the retail copy, and this to me was almost worth the price of admission, is the Seasons of Change. When using this optional rule, you place out four goal cards instead of two, but only two are in play. And they rotate each at the end of each season so that you're only using two each season and they're going to roll in. This is my preferred way to play Garinto, and I recommend throwing this in as soon as you can. Maybe play one game without it just so everyone gets on the same page, but toss that in there as quick as you can. But what is it that makes this variant stick out for you? All right. So having rotating goals really ups the long-term strategy. So in the base game, for all four seasons, you're trying to build your knowledge towards the same two goals for the entire game. So season one and season four are scoring the exact same thing. And all players are doing this. So this often means what you're trying to do each round honestly stays somewhat static. I wouldn't go so far as to say stale. But like if you're trying to build a huge collection of one tile or you're trying to keep everything even for the whole game or you're trying to make sure you're the lowest in a couple elements. Well, with seasons of change, what you score changes every season. Every season, two cards are in play. And since they're four seasons, the cards are going to rotate each round. It actually means that each scoring card is going to be in play twice. But every time it's in play, it's with a different pair, which I thought was fascinating. This leads to a lot more having to plan ahead and more variation and adaptability required to play well. All right, well, now with your copy of the game, you also got some expansion content. How about highlight what each of these does, starting with the five-player expansion? All right, it's, it's simple. It lets you play with five players. Like, honestly, that's pretty much it. Now, the big change is that you do add five more of each element tile to the game. These are randomized in the bag with the rest of the tiles at the beginning of the game. And when you're building the mountain, you just stack everything one higher. So with the basic setup, you're going 5-4-3 instead of 4-3-2. Gameplay-wise, having five players, all that actually means is that every single tile will be taken from the path and none are removed from play. So you will get to the point where the last player in turn order is going to be forced to play what's up, which is a, a slight change in tone, I guess you would say. So simple enough. How about the dragon tiles and the other Kickstarter upgrades? Okay, so the upgrades, there's not a lot. Like, you know how some Kickstarters, you get a ridiculous amount of upgraded components. These are pretty basic, but they're cool. You get a 3D solid plastic Gorento for the round marker instead of a cardboard standee, and the first player tokens metal. That's your upgrades. Now, what you do get is five dragon tiles, and this is what I think is worth the price of entry. Now, to use the dragon tiles, you again just toss them in the bag at the start of the game. And then, when you're putting out the mountain, they could come up or when filling out the path, they could come up in either place. So when picking a dragon from the path and you're putting it on the mountain, you get to decide what element that is that turn. So you could use it as fire, water, and your existing knowledge, it plays off that. Now, once it's on the mountain, you don't have to remember what it was. It doesn't matter anymore. Now, when you take it off the mountain, similarly, it's a wild card. You put it in whatever knowledge slot on your personal player board you want. So a great way to you know even off a set you want even or to get you one tile in a color you didn't have before. Now, one interesting effect of using these, though, is it does remove one bit of perfect information from the game. In Garinto, normally every tile comes out of the bag every game. With this, five are going to be left in the bag that never enter play. Now, if you don't like this, this isn't an official variant, but a house rule of my own is take out one of each color, and then you still keep that perfect balance. But honestly, the variation of five tiles isn't going to hurt much. Well, now that we know how to play Garinto, its variants and expansion, it's time to, it's time to talk about why we love this game so much. 
Yeah, so unlike our usual reviews, and now you'll find out what we think. You know what we think. If you pay attention to us on social media, we talk about Grinto all the time. This is a fantastic game. This is a game that I have enjoyed since sitting down at the Tallulah Cafe with Deanna and bringing it out for the first time with the prototype copy with the little plastic disc with the stickers on it. Uh, this is just great. And I am happy to say that the production version has everything I loved about that, but more. So, uh, indeed, the additional variant forms and dragon tiles really were nothing but a boost to an already fun game. Yeah, overall, the game plays engaging, both tactical and strategic, but dead simple to learn and teach. You literally are just taking a tile from one spot, put it in another, and grabbing up the four tiles. This is one of those games that I honestly think earned the term in elegant. I know people like to toss around, that's an elegant game, this is an elegant game. No, this really is an elegant game. And I played this game with hardcore heavy gamers. I played it with kids. I played it with non-gamers. And all of them have enjoyed the game. And honestly, I'm sure they're out there. I'm not trying to say you don't exist, but I have yet to teach Corinto to someone that did not enjoy it. I'm sure there's some people out there that don't love it as much as we do, but I have met them myself. And teaching is a bit of an exaggeration. It's really not tough to pick up at all. Though different variations, of course, do require differing knowledge to greater or lesser degrees. Well, this is one of those games where learning to play is easy. Learning to play well is something totally different. Now, things I appreciate being in this now production copy, right, since we first got to play, include the improved tiles, which honestly, I'd love to touch the feel, uh, the better looking player boards, the added variety in goal cards, as well as some of the new additions. Like I do like the new two player rules I already mentioned about the burrowing. That's pretty cool. And the whole Kitsune thing didn't even exist when I played this. I got to say that's amazing. I really, it's, it's interesting. You're putting out like the head of the fox and the tail of the fox. Like it, it's not just to flip a card and find out what Kitsune did. There's, it's a little bit more involved. I didn't want to get into full details. Um, and then of course, the, the Seasons of Change variant. Now the Seasons of Change variant, I praise so much that the designer Mark is, or sorry, not the designer, the publisher is strongly suggesting making that the default way of play. I strongly recommend everyone use Seasons of Change from your second game on. So quite the ringing recommendation there, but let's not pretend it's perfect. Yeah, despite how much we love this game, it's not all roses. This is not perfect. There are some minor issues here I do want to call out. And the first, which is the most glaring, is the fact that the rule card for the five-player expansion doesn't actually tell you what to do with the additional tiles that come with it. So the first time we played, we're like, I don't know, we just tossed them in the bag. And all that did was mess up the distribution of the tiles. Like we had way too much fire out that game. And then the last couple rounds of the game, our mountain was like almost empty. We're like, like it wasn't empty. There was stuff to grab, but like your last round, you're not grabbing four tiles. You're lucky if you get two or three. Now for our second game, we're like, well, because the mountain ran out and we got lots of extra tiles, why don't we try putting extra tiles out on the mountain right at the start of the game? And while well, that played out much smoother, and it turns out that's the way the designer intended it to be played. And while well, I already explained that during the rule teach anyway. However, we only figured this out that it was official by asking around online. Now, I do know this rule misprint is something on the list to be fixed if they ever have to do a second printing of the expansion. A minor yet rather important detail. As we point out, not everyone who gets games has the knowledge or ability to figure out how to contact the publisher to get answers or dig through forums on BoardGameGeek. And I will shout out something that uh, is Mark Spector at Grand Gamers Guild. He's the, the owner of Grand Gamers Guild. He's been fantastic uh, through our entire Corinthian experience. Like he has been there to answer every question I've ever had, as well as doing some awesome, cool stuff that not every publisher does, like retweeting our content and, you know, thumbsing up anytime we talk about Corinthian. So next complaint is the scoring track. And I know I, this is a problem in many games. It's a minor thing and you can keep score however you want. We could use poker chips, we could write it down, but I hate the scoring track in this game. It's just not long enough. It goes around the, the board and it only goes up to 50 and the standees for your player thing like the fallover. I just, I, I don't like this score track. It just kind of bugs me. I don't know what I do better, but like it only goes to 50 and I don't think I've ever played a game of Garinto where someone didn't get past at least 50. And I've had multiple games where they go past 150. And yes, there are little tiny cardboard stars in the player colors that plus 50 on one side and plus 100 that you're supposed to put somewhere. 
Like, I get it, but I just would have preferred some type of longer crack. I don't know. Maybe it needed to sneak and then sneak back around. I, I don't know where you put it, but it, it I just wish it was longer. This is a tough one. Scoring tracks are notoriously tricky to work out with available space without, you know, adding a whole other scoring section to the game, with, yeah. which costs more. You know what, though? This is more people need to do this. So if it gets bumped, it stinks. Give me two rows. One that says 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and a bottom that says one through nine. Just do that. I just I need two scoring tokens for every player, but that's way less space than 50 individual items. Now, my final complaint, unfortunately, is about the plastic tiles. Well, I love them in many ways. I love how they feel. I like the sound they make in the bag. I like how thick they are. I love how much easier it is to look at the mountain and see what's on the bottom of a stack and easily look around to see what colors are there. So I know what I'm going to draft, but they're, they, they stack too well. But she didn't, wouldn't think this is a complaint, but it's a problem in three ways. So for one, they like to stick together. This is a pain in the bag, and it makes pulling out one tile at a time actually difficult. You're like, you tend to grab stacks and kind of do them together and putting it away stinks because when you're you're putting your stacks away they're all the same color and you want to split them off or else you might pull them out together but then they also stick together on the mountain so often you can't just grab your tile it takes two hands you got to go in and you got to hold the bottom and then you got to pop your tile off the top finally though and this is my biggest issue is they stack so well you can't tell how many are in a stack at a glance now, yes, when you're holding it up to your face, you can easily tell them apart. But when I'm looking across the table at, say, Sean's stack of things, trying to figure out, does he have the lowest orange or do I? I don't want to tip my hand and say, hey, Sean, how many fire tiles do you have? I want to be able to look at a glance and go, okay, I have the low lowest right now. But if he gets one more tile, we're good. And if I say, how many do you have? He's like, oh, wait, Mo's looking at fire tiles, right? It kind of spoils it. I just wish there was something like a ring around the bottom. Like I thought about taking a Sharpie to them or symbols or dots on the sides, maybe put the elements on the sides. I don't know, just something to make them easier to count at a glance. Now this is certainly easily solvable with a Sharpie, but we always prefer first party solutions where possible. Now another suggestion that uh, Ryan Macklin, the Ryan Macklin of the internet uh, pointed out to me was um, a measuring stick. Like just a, a measuring stick you could do. But again, I don't know if that helps when looking across the table. Now, all of these issues, honestly, are minor. Um, I know Mark from Grand Gamers Guild has already fixes in place for some of them. If we ever get to a second printing, this game needs a second printing. Code, bond, code, bellhop. Go buy them so they can make better versions. I know. And then you're like, but then I'll have the old version. We need to sell this game so we can do another printing that fixes these problems. And it's not just us. While we have certainly been responsible for a number of others playing the game and buying the game, I don't think I've yet seen anyone disappointed that we nudge them to it. It's yeah. just a fun game. Yeah, overall, not only do we love Garinto, but pretty much everyone I've talked Garinto to has loved it as well. Uh, to me, this is the definition of a modern classic. This is a modern classic tile laying game that should be talked about in the same breaths as games like Sagrada and Azul. And honestly, in my opinion, a bit above both of those. Rento is easy to learn, difficult to master. Requires a lot of strategy to play well, but is dead simple to learn. Features near perfect information, and winning means not only watching what you're doing, but keeping careful track of what everyone else is doing at the table as well. I think one of the major things holding it back from reaching the levels of Sagrada Azul is simply distribution and marketing budgets. Though, of course, the pandemic hasn't helped no. either. Uh, yeah, the timing here. There's certainly nothing about the game itself that, sh that would hold it back from being a uh, mass market hit. Big thing with this too is the physicality. This game would have shown so well at cons. The, the stacking tiles. Uh, it's bad timing. It happens. Uh, Garento is one of those rare games I honestly think almost every green group is going to enjoy and should get a copy of. I can almost recommend this universally. I do say almost though, because there is groups of gamers out there that I don't think would be interested in this. You know, the, the story gamers looking for an RPG and an epic experience, Ameritrash fans who love adventure games and dungeon crawls and high excitement levels and speedy play and simultaneous movement or lots and lots of dice and randomness. All those players aren't going to find any of that here. But if you enjoy abstract strategy games at all, you owe it to yourself to find a way to try Garanto. Like, I would actually go so far as to say you're probably safe to just pick it up. 
If you can't find a way to try before you're by, you're probably going to be perfectly fine picking it up. And if you don't like it, you'll probably be easily able to find someone else who will. Uh, currently, there are no legitimate versions of online play for Garinto, though we'll keep folks updated if that changes. Yeah, that would be odd. I would love to be able to play Garinto online. Now, as for the expansions, I've found them to be fully optional, honestly. Like, they're neat, but you don't need them. Um, now, if you have a green group that's five players all the time, pick up the five-player expansion. If your game group is four players, usually don't pick up the five-player expansion. Now, as for the dragons, I like them well enough. Um, my kids really dig them. They like the wild card. Like, there's just something about playing a wild card they like. So I usually just don't take them out of my copy. I just leave my dragons mixed in with everything else. So if having something like in this game, it, like having wild card sounds fun to you that, and adds that little no perfect information, you may have a little bit less red than another color of that game because there's some stuck in the bag, go for it. Also, remember... You can get both of those things all together, Kickstarter and everything, with our limited time discount code. That's right. Starting tonight and lasting the rest of May, you can get the Kickstarter edition of Garinto and the fifth player expansion for only $44.99 when buying direct from Grand Gamers Guild and using the code BELLHOP, all caps, one word. Of course, we will throw a link to where you can get that directly and just purchase it, though you don't have to. You can go there on their own. You don't have to click our link. But I'll make it as easy as I can to get there. That's it for our review of Gorinto, a modern classic we hope will become an evergreen as yeah. more and more gamers discover it. Now, what's a game you love that you wish more people would try? Tell us all about it in the comments below. And when you get a chance, I welcome you to also check out my written review over at tabletopbellhop.com, where I might add a little bit more information. There'll be a link to where you can get the game, and I'll have lots of pictures so you can see just how nice those tiles are. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. Okay, let's start with Charterstone. So Friday night, we wrapped up both games 10 and 11 which honestly resulted in my first real disappointment with the campaign so far. Don't worry, no spoilers, same as always. I'm not going to spoil anything, but Game 10 did a new thing, which led us to think we had to do something, and we wasted a lot of time doing that thing, and it didn't matter at all. Not only did it not matter or the end or what we were doing, actually none of the game mattered. Uh, what we did in the game, well, I guess we added new stuff to the board and we got some points, but at the end of the game, we scratched off the gateway card and learned that nothing we did mattered at all for the ongoing story. Our destiny was predetermined before the game ever started, and I didn't enjoy that at all. That's always a tough turn for a game to take. Now, while I'm sure the actions will have some impact on endgame scoring, yeah. the fact that it wasn't useful for that particular game has got to hurt. Sorry, I said the wrong word. I said gateway card, goal post card, goal post card. And sorry if you haven't gotten past phase to game one. They're unlocked, like the first thing you unlock. If you've never played before, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. So, yeah, we got to play. Players earned their glory, and they checked off personas and all the normal end game things, and people got points, and someone got to mark off a chalice. And the game's still fun, right? It's still like Charterstone's a really solid worker placement game. But none of it mattered as far as the direction of the campaign. And honestly, that felt broken. Like, like how did you like totally skip this and and there was even a part that doesn't make sense which we'll see if it changed by the end of the game like the end of the series to see if something mattered now game 11 on the other hand was rather cool and honestly one of my favorite games so far due to what happened at the end of game 10 and what was happening in the game we were forced to play charterstone with some severe limitations which i actually found to be a lot of fun what it meant is we couldn't go to our fallback our default strategies like over playing these 10 games Certain people tend to do certain combos to get them points every game. Tori likes to go for reputation and does a wheat thing. Cat likes to play in her own little kingdom and not play nice with everyone else and do these little pumpkin strategies. I just fumble around and don't know what the heck I'm doing and, and go all over the board. And we still haven't figured out what he's trying to do in the game since game one. So she does her own thing. And I like that we couldn't do those things. Like, especially like Cat was the only one that was in a pretty good shape for that particular one. So I did dig that. So I guess it's a bit of take the good with the bad. The disappointment of 10 is what gave you those changes and limits on 11, which you enjoyed. Yeah, though it technically had nothing to do with game 10. Those limits were set from game all the games before 10. It said 10 mattered, not at all. Like, like yeah, we got some points. We got score. Nah. 
Now, game 11, of course, ended with the big surprise because it's the second to last game. You know, the the finale is coming up. And as I predicted, it's exactly what I thought it was going to be, though it handled it interestingly. And this was kind of neat because we actually had to do some some time travel, some looking back, some some memory thing. Now, these weren't memory, but like during the game, you had this little box and like there's a few things. So what we've been playing, they're like, just just throw it in your box. Just throw it in your box. I think you were there for one of them. Just throw it in your box. And well, we got to pull all that out and it all mattered now, which I knew it had to come up sometime. So that was pretty cool. Um, so now we have one game left, though it's going to be a bit before we get to that. Um, D and I are, of course, heading out of town and Sean's heading into town the week after that. So it's going to be at least three weeks before we get back to Charterstone. So sorry, we won't get to the review sooner, but not sorry. I'm going to get some good gaming instead. Yeah, yeah I don't think we're going to have you join us for the last battle. No, that would we'll be save that one. <laughs> Now, next up, we played a three-player game of Scurvy Dice. This one's off my pile of shame. I played this with Tori and Kat while Deanna was making us all ramen. Uh, This is a push-your-luck dice game with a pirate theme. Each round, you've got these 10 ship dice. You're going to roll them. And, of course, you can re-roll once, so it's not quite Yahtzee. And you're going to use what comes up on them to build your ship, including, like, sails, hull, crew, cannons, and potentially one parrot. Now, each round, once you've got your ship built, you're going to act in sail order, firing cannons at the other players, launching boarding actions if you can catch the opponent's ship, and eventually gathering loot in a quest to score 20 points, or 10 in a short game. Sounds like a quick, fun party game. Yeah, this is, it, it, it's definitely, it's, it's not, the 10 is quick, 20 took longer than I'd expect. But you could set any point score you want, and definitely it is that fun party game style. Uh, it involves a lot of dice rolling. Um, not just because you're rolling your ships to build a ship at the beginning, but then each phase has your rolling dice. Like when you fire your cannons, you pick up your cannons, you roll them to see where you hit. You then, when you go to board, have to roll sails, and we both roll our sails. And if we tie, we have to re-roll our sails. And then once you do catch someone and you board them, you're now rolling your crew. And when you roll your crew, you're adding up the values on the dice to see who wins the battle, and that only defeats one die. And then you can fight another round or you can retreat. It's just tons and tons and tons of rolling, which makes this a random fest of all rando fests. Uh, this is, is a highly random game. Now, I will admit, I'm playing with Tori and Kat, so I think that's the main reason. But this was a lot of fun. Like, we had a lot of fun playing Scurvy Dice. Uh, Those two in particular are fun to play Take That games with. Um, And no, they don't just gang up on each other or team up on other players. They're fun to play with. It just, it's not my kind of game. I personally probably won't be keeping this one. Um, What I will say, though, is if you like that kind of game, if you like the the highly random Take That games, you'll dig this. Um, the, The group of players this most seems like it would appeal to me, uh, to them it would be the players of Munchkin. If you dig Munchkin, this is a game for you. You're going to dig this game. And could probably make it onto some people's travel lists, I bet, True. if you like some semi-mindless random fun. Yeah, if I'd liked it more, it probably would have been on our recommendations. Just too random for me. All right, next, we played some more Spell Smashers. This time we got to play with more than two players. Uh, first with Tori and Kat, and then later with Mim on Mother's Day. Well, there's nothing wrong with this game at two, like at all. It plays perfectly fine with two players. It just plays better with more than two players. You end up with more monsters in play. There's more players hitting those monsters. Initiative becomes very important. And strategies like playing a small word in order to jump in and get the killing blow at the end of a round is a more valid strategy with more. So does pronouncing it get any easier the more you've played it? Well, so far I haven't messed it up, and I didn't mess it up on uh, on uh, and on the the what you play Wednesday yet. So I think I've I finally kind of got it down. <laughs> now I am pleased to say both Kator and Mim digged it, digged it, and dug it. I can't say other things. I can say spell smashers now, but I can't say anything else. That's that's been my whole problem the whole night is I retrained my vocabulary to say spell smashers. Now Deanna finally did manage to redeem herself, trouncing both me and Mim on Sunday, though she was liking to make up words when we played on Friday. Is Vax a real word? That was one we had that we had the debate, and it ends up because of the pandemic, it is now. Miriam Webster added it in 2021. There we go. That was one we called around. Uh, honestly, I expect this one to keep seeing regular play. Uh, this is probably going to be our new spelling game that we play more often. I'll have to see if we can uh, fit it in when I'm down there, so I can have an opinion when we get to the review. We'll see. We'll see if you'll be able to, to come up with better words than Deanna can. Now, in addition to Spell Smashers, we also played a game of Space Base with the whole family. This was Mother's Day. I don't really have a lot to say about this one other than everyone had a good time. And wow, I prefer the right light speed variant. It's the first time I played without it in a while. And it's just 
like we had a new player mim had never played before so so i didn't throw that in because having to buy cards right at the beginning is hard if you don't know what the cards do and you don't know the game so i get it but i think we probably should have just said spend as much as you want and buy random cards and you'll see how it works because that initial ramp up is dull like it really is like, there's just too many turns especially with five players waiting for it to get around the table to you when all you need is a you happen to get an 11 as your first one card yeah. so you're like all right i'm just gonna see here in a game where you're supposed to be engaged all the time so i strongly recommend light speed variant all the time other than that uh, we did use the mining rules which was interesting so that was cool and that worked fine with a new player so well, I'm really enjoying this on Board Game Arena as it's so much less fiddly than on TTS or in person. And if you're willing to let the system make obvious choices for you, real-time games of it are so fast on Board Game Arena. Yeah, even turn-based is pretty quick compared to some of our other turn-based games. Yeah. Just because the auto yeah. turns. Now, the only thing I wish is Board Game Arena had Shy Pluto. Like, I admit, I don't love the mines, but I don't mind them. But take it or leave mining. But I love the new, the other cards. I want the other cards. I want the the diagonal ups and the the can place anywhere from slot eight on and on and the ones that let you swap stuff. And I miss those, like, especially having played this weekend with all of that in. I was just like, where are these when we play with Sean? And well, yeah, I have to remember to take my turns more often. So given that it's still quite new on Board Game Arena, it, it, it just popped out of alpha recently. Yeah. Uh, I expect they'll get around to the expansions, though I doubt you'll be able to play through the whole Shy, Exper uh, Shy Pluto expansion, more than likely just use the out resulting outcome of Shy Pluto. Uh, maybe, I don't know, think of how they did the crew. I think they could totally do it, because if that worked for that style of game. All right, next up, two more games off the pile of shame. These were a couple lighter games that Deanna played on our actual anniversary. Like, we're going away for our anniversary, but the anniversary was actually back on the 8th. Uh, both of these, Pile of Shame, first was, and I still don't know how I'm supposed to pronounce this, it's either Gunkimono, or I want to say Gunkamono, because it's a domino-based game, and to me, it, the word should sound like domino. Gunkimono, Gunkamono, Gunky, I don't know, whatever it's called. This is a domino-based game set in the warring states of feudal Japan, which doesn't really matter at all. This is an abstract strategy game with a pasted-on but kind of cool theme with some great Japanese style artwork and one of the best first player tokens I've ever seen, which is actually a, a, a katana ipo, because it's a actual large, surprisingly large wooden katana. Uh, in Gunkamino, you are playing domino style tiles, tiles on a large gridded board. And for each tile played, you have to pick what you want to do with each half. You can either score points in which you're going to get points equal to the number of orthogonally adjacent tiles of the same type that you just played. That are connected to each other so you connect a bunch of sixes and you get six points or you can score honor honor moves your tokens up on a track of the appropriate color and this is on the side of the board once you get far enough on the honor track you're going to unlock strongholds and this is the neat part that really makes this game is the strongholds you place on a color that's on the board and you now control that area and every round you're going to score points on it of course then your opponent's going to start playing their domino so that your stronghold starts to shrink uh, there are two strongholds to unlock, and you can also get bonus points if you reach the end of any of these tracks. Now, it's a very high-level overview, but I think gives you a kind of good idea of what the how it plays. All right, this is one of those, sounds like one of those games uh, you can easily get caught being stuck on one strategy and miss mm. the right timing to swap strategies, which is something I'm horrible at doing when <laughs> I start <laughs> fixating on one strategy. Now, we this was one uh, that I thought was cool because I, we actually played it twice in a row and I tried two totally different. Like my first game, I was like, I'm scoring everything. And then my second game, I'm like, I'm all about the tracks. And I got to say so far, all about the tracks seems to be the better strategy, but we'll see. Um, one amusing thing about this. So when I read the rules to this, I was like, huh, that's it. Like, like that doesn't sound like much. Like, yeah, it's better than dominoes. It's not quite as late as King Domino, but like I'm just playing tiles and matching them. So then I actually went online and, and I Googled, you know, how to play. And Becca Scott comes up first, in which Becca is really good at being succinct at teaching how to play games. And she confirmed, yep, that's it. You, you put tiles, you score points, or you go up on tracks. So when sitting down to teach this, Deanna, I actually kind of gave her the warning. I'm like, I, this could go either way. Either we're going to sit down, we're going to play this once, and we'll be like, yeah, okay, that was fun. Let's put that in the extra life pile. Or we're going to be like, wow, this is a hidden gem. This is a great abstract strategy game with more going on than you expect. 
And I'm happy to say it was the latter. Conkonmano is a solid, like really solid, a simple game. It was good enough that, like I said, my Euro-loving wife is like, let's play this again right now. 30-minute game, 15-minute game maybe. I, we didn't have a timer on. Totally sold on this one so far. So Google is telling me in my ears that it is pronounced Gun Kimono. Gun Kimono. See, it doesn't sound like Domino, though. And it's, it's the because, fact it's it, got... but, but it's actually a real Japanese world word meaning military memoirs. Okay, so I get it. So it's so not kimono. It, it happens to sort of be a play on domino, but not really. Right. But uh, I, I think someone hear. thinks it's a play on domino. <laughs> but uh, great to hear that it's uh, uh, it went over so well. Yeah, this is one we've now played it twice. Um, I made sure we didn't mess anything up, and I can't wait to try this with more players. And this plays up to five, which is nice. So this will be a good one when you're down. Tori and Cat are here. We'll have five players. I think this will be a perfect one. Sounds like a plan. All right, the next pile of shame game and final game I've got for this week is a game of Terror Below. This was interesting because this started having to make a complete copy of the game. So this is a game I got off a local content creator who was purging her collection, and she gave me two copies at the time. And I was picking up other stories like, do you want Terror Below? I'm like, sure. She's like, okay, well, there's two copies, but these are both used demo copies that have been at cons, and maybe you'll be able to make one complete game out of the two of them. So uh, <clears throat> uh, hazards of getting off game, getting games off of people who work in the industry. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the first time I've actually gotten a demo copy. That was how I was able to reveal, uh, review Dead Man's Cabal, is I just begged the Pandasaurus people. I'm like, this game's about Necromancer Dance Party with little skulls. You got to let me review it. And I'm like, no. I'm like, come on. They're like, we're going to sell out. Why would I give you a review copy? We're going to sell out. I'm like, wait, what about your demo copies? They're like, really? You want a demo copy? I'm like, yeah. They're like, oh, we'll see. And then at the end, they're like, well, you can have this demo copy, but it might not be complete. And sure enough, it was. We were good. So this time, we actually took us time to go through everything. Um, there were literally two copies, but one was, like, only partially punched. And, but, like, the standees were all in one box. It, like, it, was, it was a bit of a mess, and it took longer than it should have. But we ended up with one complete copy with a malformed meeple, some odd paint jobs on the other meeple, where one side's one way and the other side's different, and some slightly dinged cards and one missing weapon card. Now, we also ended up with another copy that had all of the Hobbit-sized cards still sealed, the cardboard pieces completely unpunched, and perfect-looking cards otherwise. You know what? I, I was on the fence for a bit, but we decided to keep or play the slightly beat-up copy, and we put the other side one aside to sell, uh, or auction, or perhaps give away. A nice little side benefit until you realize how vital that one weapon card truly is. See, at this point, I don't know what it is. I'm, I'm just, I'm going spoiler free. And if I don't know I'm missing that weapon card, I, I don't never matter to me. Now, the important one that didn't just have me like, let's sell it right away. We only have one rule book between the two. So that's a little annoying. Right now it's in my copy of the game, but I think we'll probably toss it. And the other ones we've, you know, mastered the gameplay and not played extreme. Now, as for the game itself, Terror Below, I wasn't expecting much. Like, I know this is based on cult classic comedy horror movies like Critters and Tremors and not much else. I, <laughs> the board looks like a giant egg and it's in a cavern. You have all these weird worm standees. What I wasn't expecting was a rather silly but solid pick up and deliver game where you're moving little meeple vehicles around the board, dodging and collecting rubble, avoiding worms, collecting eggs, and then bringing those eggs to various locations to earn points and rewards. While it's light and humorous as fitting the theme, there's a really solid game here, which honestly put the game in a perfect spot for Deanna and I. It's a great casual game that still has enough meat to keep us interested. Again, a good date night game in the fact that we can socialize and chat and have Spotify playing while still having fun playing it. This is one that I think is going to wow Tori and Kat, especially Tori, because Tori is going to love the classic comedy horror theme here. And just to be clear, there is a rule book available on BGHG as well as a multi-page rules clarification from the designer. Okay. So uh, worth looking worth, at. We didn't to, come. You know, yeah. To be okay. honest, it's one of those games where even if the rules weren't clear, you just kind of went. All right. You just kind of went with it. You're like, eh, sounds like it should be this. Yeah, I know. I think it's all pretty straightforward, but it's nice to know that the designer has gone and gone to the effort and making sure that everything's out there. And they went through basically it's a, it's an FAQ based off the most common BGG questions. Right. 
Yeah, and Deanna's pointing out right now, she's in the chat saying, it's a bit gone so, but not bad by a long stretch. Like, she sat down to play and was like, I don't know what this game is, and looked at the weapons and items in her starting hand. She's like, oh, okay, that's the tone of this <laughs> game. Like, one of the moves is to ramp over another vehicle. And if an opponent's next to you, you get to skip over their spot for only one movement. And there's another side of the board with a giant chasm. And while you can ramp the chasm, but you got to roll a die, and if you're one, two, or three, you die. Right. Now, luckily in this game, you get three lives because you represent a cadre of three characters. And when one dies, you just put the other one back on top. And you can, of course, bring the dead one back by just returning an egg to the hospital. That's what this game's like. So it sounds like another sleeper win then that uh, may have missed some people by. And I got to say, um, it's a lot of Renegade games, right? Because who I got these from uh, was, was a rep for Renegade. And man, like Renegade's got some breadth here. And some really solid games. Like, I admit, I love some of their games a lot. Like, Clank is one of my favorite games of all time. But, like, these are all, like, games that kind of came out, and there wasn't a ton of buzz about. And I have enjoyed, like, Concomino, Spell Smashers, um, Terra Below, I'm trying to think, Ex Libris. Those are all Renegade games. And those are all the ones I'm like, when Shine comes down, we're going to have Renegade Game Con, because I want to show them all these Renegade games. I mean, so thumbs got, up, Renegade. They've got 270 games, so there's going to be some. Good <laughs> yeah, there's going to be some. Good, well, these happen to be good ones, right? We, none of them were flops, right? Which that's what's most impressive. All right. So, so how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? So, as noted earlier, Dan and I are heading out of town tomorrow morning, and of course, we're packing some games. Now, the main one I'm bringing for sure is Brew Crafters, the travel card game, the game that's been on my pile of shame so long I forgot about it. And um, still, like, this has to get played. So that's one of my goals this weekend, play Brew Crafters, the travel card game, and a brewery. Um, other than that, we're probably going to grab our usual milk crate of games, like the Duke patchwork in the game. Deanna has specifically pointed out she would like me to bring in Kamino, so we'll be packing that one. I'm just not sure if it'll fit, the board will fit on the table we usually play on. But it might. It should go over. And uh, <laughs> the review tonight has made... Deanna really want to play Gorinto. <laughs> She's like, rereading, because I had her read through it to make sure I wasn't making any logic mistakes or messing up rules. She's like, know what that made me want to do? Play Gorinto two player again. She really wants to try the borough rules because those didn't exist when we played. Uh, once we get back, um, we will be back before the end of the weekend and we are planning on finishing off, well, probably finishing off Star Wars Unlocked with the kids and Mim on Sunday. But I'm not putting that in stone. We, we may bring something else. We just didn't, like, we could have done it last Sunday, and it was just like, now nah, let's bring Space Base. Like, we just weren't in the mood to do an escape room game. Sometimes the kids like to fight over who gets to read or do the cards or play with the app, and we didn't want that on Mother's Day. So it'll depend on, on how, how relaxed we are, I guess, after the weekend. And, yes, I know people are probably screaming at me, don't tell people you're leaving your house. Don't worry, my mom's here. We're not leaving the house empty. A week after that, Sean comes to town. And uh, we're already, as you can tell, working on a list of games for him to experience that weekend. So to that end, this one's for the lobbyists and our fans. We've actually got more notice than usual for Sean coming into town. He's not coming in until the 21st, so you got over a week. I want to know if there's anything you think we need Sean to play. Is there anything he needs to play while he's down? Is there anything I've talked about and Sean's, you know, sat through the game recommendation going, I haven't had a chance to play that myself, but it sounds good. What do we need to Sean to play? I want to see what the patrons and our fans have to suggest. I know one would say wingspan, but unfortunately I still don't have access to that one. <laughs> and just off the cut, I just took a quick glimpse. Uh, Renegade has nine games at the top 150. That's very impressive. <laughs> that's, that's very actually, impressive. Because they aren't making those, you know, they they don't make Gloomhaven and games like that, which are tending to sort of trend very high. So to get nine games in the in the top 150 is is definitely a... Uh... Like, I know lately they're all about the licensed games, right? They're all about Transformers, G.I. Joe, Power Rangers, My Little Pony. That Those aren't games I'm checking out, but their other games definitely do interest me. Uh and uh, I know we've actually been talking about one. Uh, of their their number one ranked game for them is uh, Clank Legacy Acquisitions. So tempted. <laughs> so we're going to play a role-playing game next. Legacy games are great in theory. Yep. It has taken us a long time to get through Charterstone, even though it's <laughs> only 12 games. All righty. Now a quick shout-out. Thank you to some of our, v our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. Roger Malosh, 
thanks roger and we're gonna have to try and find some time to get uh get the spider game in yeah we do we do need to do that i i with everything going on i'm hoping after this weekend it'll like feel normal for a little while that'd be nice <laughs> what's normal? uh zopi thank you brian sheehan thanks brian david miller jr thanks again for today's topic and your ongoing support and constant activity in our discord <laughs> nice to see someone's there brian kurtz thanks brian well that was the double bell that means my shift's coming to an end and we're gonna have to lock those front doors though the doors to the lobby are closed you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com all over the web as tabletop bellhop one word and on your podcatcher of choice under tabletop bellhop gaming podcast show your support at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop and sign up for awesome bonus content including hours of bonus audio and access to our discord well that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight thank you lobbyists for joining us and i invite you to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show with unboxings tonight yes for tabletop bellhop gaming podcast i'm sean and i'm mo thank you and, and game, game on, on.